So hello and welcome to the Zen Patel course entitled Introduction to Culture Studies where we're looking at Stuart Hall's essay about identity and identity formations. And this is obviously from our uh, you know, anthology of essays that Hall edited which contains uh, the works of some of the key thinkers in culture studies including Omi Pava, uh, Nicholas Rose, uh, Sibyn Bauman, just to name a few. And of course Hall himself. So we'll just carry on with the point from the point that we stopped in the last lecture and that is looking at identity and identity formation as a process of, you know, uh, difference and how this difference becomes a very key component in identity formation, especially in, you know, discursive situations. And obviously every situation is discursive. Um, there's no non-discursive situation. Uh, and this entire idea of discursivity and identity are entangled in Hall's analysis, you know, in this particular essay, which we are examining in some details. Okay, so... Uh, this is what Hull says, and we just carry on with where we stopped at, where he says quite clearly that identities are constructed through, not outside difference. So, you know, identities are constructed through difference. It's only through a process of navigation with difference that we arrive at identifications. Identities are constructed, are produced, reproduced. Uh, you know, they're not they're situated outside difference. Okay? So, any idea of looking at identity as meta discursive in quality is outside the discursive field is uh, erroneous according to Hall. But at the same time, it's also important for us to remember that Hall is not someone who is advocating uh, discursivity for just discursivity's sake. So for him, discursivity and experientiality are connected. So experience too is part of the discursive field and discourse too is part of the experiential field. Uh, so again, we're looking at the connection. That's something which was very usefully highlighted if you remember by Ian Hacking in the book that we read, in The Social Construction of What, where he had quite clearly suggested that a very rigid uh, constructionist view of life and culture would be quite uh, sort of reductionist in quality. And obviously, uh, uh, Holloway is, doesn't require, it's not aiming for reductionism, it's actually aiming for a plural production of meaning. So it's aiming anti uh, reductionism in its own way. So uh, identities are constructed through difference. This entails the radically disturbing recognition that it is only through the relation to the other, the relation to what is not, to precisely what it likes, uh, to what has been called its constitutive outside, that the positive meaning of any term and thus its identity can be uh, constructed. So this is directly uh, quoting Derrida, but also uh, alluding to Lackley and Buffalo. Uh, so you can see how Hall is bringing in a, a range of thinkers in terms of how you know, those can be used those thinking uh, prisms can be used to look at culture and cultural identity formations. So uh, identities are constructed through a plural possibility of meanings. So throughout their careers, identities can function as points of identification and attachment uh, only because of their capacity to exclude, to leave out, to render outside objective. So identification also entails rejection, also entails uh, a selective process uh, which, you know, includes exclusion. So as you can see already that identification and representation, they have very similar politics of uh, formation, politics of designing, because even every representation too entails the process of exclusion as well as inclusion. So this entire entanglement, the entire dialectic, if you will, but an, uh, exclusion and, and, and inclusion is a very key term, a very key quality for uh, narrative uh, strategies, for narrative politics. A uh, similar thing happens over here with identifications where, you know, some things are excluded, some things are included. Um, you, know, so, you know, so it entails absence, it entails exclusion, it entails marginalization, etc. Every identity has at its margin an excess, something more. The unity, uh, uh, the internal homogeneity which the term identity treats as foundational is not a natural but a constructed form of closure. Every identity naming as is necessary, even if silence and unspoken other, that which it lacks. So the lack becomes the core component of identity. So uh, you can only achieve identification through our engagement with the other, through our engagement with absence. And this engagement with absence, this articulation of absence becomes a very key quality of an identification. So it's not just a linear rattling off of what is present, what is there, and what is always been there, but also a negotiation with absence, uh, an, an articulation of absence, an acknowledgement of absence, which uh, is invested uh, directly in the process of identification. So lack or other become the very crucial categories in identity politics. Okay, so you know these are the ways in which uh, you know uh, Hall talks about identity as a complex uh, phenomena, 
where you know he brings an entirety of discursivity ideology and how to negotiate with these ideology uh, and discursivity in terms of you know uh, you know articulating the absence articulating the lack articulating the non present articulating uh, the impossible so all these articulations become important in the process of identification so it's not just what you have what you, what you can say but also what you can't say uh, and that becomes important in terms of uh, uh, identification so and obviously those of us uh, you know, who have read the entire, say, the essay by uh, Orwell, Shooting the Elephant, or Fano's Black and White Marks, you can see how absence has become a very important uh, component of identification. How what you can't be, how what you can't say, how what you can't articulate, uh, how what you can't acknowledge uh, become very important categories for any identification process, which is uh, non innocuous and quality. Right, okay, and now there's a reference uh, this essay makes to Althusser's essay ideological state of parrotus, um, uh, 1971. Um, you know, and it's a very important term that uh, Althusser mentions and alludes to in that essay, the term of interpolation. Uh, interpolation, as you know, is a process to which a subject you know, is indoctrinated into ideology, uh, a process to which a subject is uh, you know, discursivized, if you will, or you know, converted into ideological uh, you know, a vessel for ideology. Uh, brainwashed to a certain extent, um, you know, converted to a certain extent, discursivized to a certain extent. So all these different combinations are at play uh, in the process of interpolation, and that's something that Althusser mentions quite clearly in the essay, 1971, which is um, alluded to by Hall here. So this essay introduced uh, the notion of interpolation and a speculary structure of ideology in an attempt to circumvent the economism and reductionism of the classical Marxist theory of ideology and to bring together within one explanatory framework both the materialist function of ideology in reproducing the social relations of production, Marxism, and through its borrowings from Lacan, uh, the symbolic function of ideology in the constitution of subjects. So the symbolic function and the real function are both equally at play. Uh, at interpolation. So the symbolic function is more akin to the psychological function, whereas the material uh, function is more akin and more related uh, to the uh, economic function. So, you know, this is again a very nice uh, uh, wedding, if you will, of Marxism and psychoanalysis, Marxism and psychology uh, that is offered by Hall. So, uh, and then there's a reference to Michelle Barrett, uh, a very important thinker. Michelle Barrett, in a recent discussion of this debate, has gone a considerable way to demonstrating the profoundly divided and contradictory nature of the argument Althusa was beginning to make. The two sides of the difficult problem of ideology were fractured in the essay and ever since have been assigned to different poles. Nevertheless, nevertheless, the ISA's essay, as it came to be known, has turned out to be a highly significant, even if not successful, moment in the debate. Uh, Jacqueline Rose, for example, has argued in sexuality in the field of vision that the question of identity, now how it is constituted and maintained, is therefore the central issue through which psychoanalysis enters the political field. So what we're seeing here is how psychoanalysis becomes a political instrument, how psychoanalysis becomes a, an object of study, uh, not just of neural internal behaviors, but also of ideological behaviors. So again, the question of inside and outside uh, come into being uh, in, in a very, very interesting way. Okay, uh, and then he goes on and Tech talks about Foucault quite a lot and Foucault obviously is a very important uh, um, philosopher as we've already seen when it comes to questions of authority, knowledge, etc. Uh, and that's something that, um, you know, um, Hall is quite interested in as well. The question of authority, the question of sexuality, the question of the historical production of power uh, is something that you know, Hall keeps uh, you know, referring to throughout his essay. Okay, uh, and now he comes to um, the Foucauldian way of looking at the subject production, and this should be on the screen, where he says quite clearly, the subject is produced as an effect through and within discourse, within specific discursive formations, and has no existence and certainly no transcendental continuity or identity from one subject position to another. In its archaeological work, Madness and Civilization, the Birth of the Clinic, the Order of Things, and the Archaeology of Knowledge, discourses construct subject positions through the rules of formation and modalities of enunciation. Powerfully compelling and original as these works are, the criticism leveled against them in this respect at least seems justified. So there's a critique of Foucault that is offered by Holloway, a 
you know, and that critique is that the one dimensionality of the power positions, the one dimensionality of discourse movement is something that uh, you know, Hall is highlighting in terms of looking at Foucault. So according to Hall, uh, the, the movement of uh, discursivity, the, the mobility of discursivity is one dimensional in Foucault's works and that's something which is, he thinks, a fair critique uh, of Foucault. <coughs> okay, so, right, and then we come towards the uh, closing of this essay where he talks about uh, Butler, he brings up Butler and he looks at how Butler uh, looks at his discursive quality of identity, discursive quality of sexual identity and how it becomes a very important category uh, in cultural studies. And the mention of Butler comes with Gender Trouble which is a book that we have already covered for the, in this particular course. In Gender Trouble and more especially in Bodies of Matter, Judith Butler has taken up, through her concern with the discursive limits of sex and with the politics of feminism, the complex transactions between the subject, the body and identity. Uh, through the drawing together in one analytic framework, insights drawn from a Foucaultian and a psychoanalytic perspective. So, you know, Butler, according to uh, uh, Holloway, uh, combines the Foucaultian and the psychoanalytic perspective in her understanding of uh, the discursive limits of sexuality. Adopting the position that the subject is discursively constructed and there is no subject before or outside the law, Butler develops a rigorously argued case that, and I quote, and Hall quotes, uh, sex is from the start normative. It is what Foucault has called a regulatory ideal. In this sense, then sex not only functions as a norm, but as part of a regulatory practice that produces the, the bodies it governs, that is, whose regulatory force is made clear as a kind of productive power the power to produce, demarcate, uh, circulate, differentiate the bodies it controls. Sex is an ideal construct which is forcibly materialized through time. So again, the question of temporality becomes very important and it's a process of materialization through time that is highlighted by Butler in this particular section and very uh, conveniently quoted by Hall. But what Butler is saying over here is that every act of, uh, you know, every sexual identity is produces a certain discursive you know, time, discursive points of time and of course there's nothing outside the law, there's nothing outside the uh, you know, discursive it is, there's nothing outside the discursive field. So in that too is quite deridden one might argue because you know the deridden quotation, the very famous deridden quotation that there's no outside of the text uh, is all textual and quality and you know obviously experientiality and textuality are interrelated over here. Uh, there's no experience outside of the text, uh, there's no uh, identity outside of this discursive field or the discursive mapping is something that Butler highlights quite clearly and something which is quoted and drawn on by, uh, by Hall in this section. So materialization here is rethought as an effect of power. The view that the subject is produced in the course of its materialization is strongly grounded in the, in the performative theory of language and the, and the subject. Uh, but performativity is shown of its associations with volition, choice and intentionality and again some of the misreadings of general trouble reread not as the act by which a subject brings into being what she or he names, uh, names but rather as that reiterated power of discourse to produce the phenomenon that it regulates and constrains. So performativity uh, according to Butler is not a freedom from discursivity but rather performativity is a deeper engagement with discursivity, uh, how identities are formed within certain discursive fields. So performativity, there is one sort of a misreading of Butler that we often do as, as students of Butler and that is we look at performativity as always necessarily subversive, as something which uh, subverts the constructed quality of gender etc. But actually performativity is yet another iteration, is a reiteration one might argue, a uh, more complex reiteration perhaps of the discursive quality of sexual identity and that is something which is highlighted by Butler over and over again. The decisive shift from the viewpoint of the argument being developed here, however, is a linking of this process of assuming a sex with a question of identification and with that discursive means, uh, with the discursive means by which the heterosexual imperative enables certain sex identifications and fill closes and or disavows other identifications. This centering of the question of identification together with the problematic of the subject with assumptions of sex opens up a critical and reflexive dialogue in Butler's work between Foucault and psychoanalysis which is enormously productive. It is true that Butler does not provide an elaborate uh, theoretical meta-argument for the way the two perspectives of the relation between the discursive and the psychic are thought together in her text beyond a suggestive indication. There may be a way 
to subject psychoanalysis to a Foucauldian redescription, even as Foucault himself refused the possibility. At any rate, uh, this text accepts as a point of departure Foucault's notion that regulatory power produces the subject of the controls. The power uh, is not only imposed externally, uh, but works as a regulatory and normative means by which subjects are formed. The return to psychoanalysis then is guided by the questions of how certain regulatory norms form a sex subject in terms of the establish the indistinguishability of psychic and bodily phenomenon. So, the psychic, the body, the intercorporeal, corporeal, the intersubjective phenomena, they're all linked together over here. And obviously, intercorporeal means between bodies. So, when bodies uh, inhabit certain discursive fields, there's an intercorporeal exchange that takes place, the intersubjective exchange that takes place. And this intersubjectivity, the intercorporeality, uh, is part of the economy of identifications that is highlighted by Hall over here. Okay. And Hall is interested in Butler because he thinks Butler is one of the very few thinkers who brings in the Foucauldian power uh, politics and merges that with a psychoanalytic way of looking at you know, productions of power, uh, productions of identity, etc. And that's a very rich uh, range that is sort of woven in uh, according to Hall. And that's the reason why he lauds and appreciates Butler and, and respects Butler as, as a critic because of her ability to merge in these two sort of seemingly different disciplines, psychoanalysis and Foucauldian power politics. However, Butler's relevance to the argument is made all the more pertinent because it is developed in the context of the discussion of gender and sexuality framed by feminism and so is directly recurrent both to the questions of identity and identity politics. Uh, so, you know, Butler's work is important in the questions of identity and identity politics because it is uh, something which is, uh, you know, inherently uh, sort of performative and inherently, uh, you know, aware of the discursive qualities of gender, discursive qualities of gender identities, etc. Uh, Butler makes a powerful case that all identities operate through exclusion, through the discursive construction of a con constitutive outside and the production of abjected and marginalized subjects apparently outside the field of the symbolic, the representable, the production of an outside, a domain of intelligible effects, which then returns to trouble and unsettle the foreclosures which we prematurely call identities. So, you know, the whole idea of negotiating with absence, negotiating with, uh, you know, the outside, neg negotiating with the uh, other becomes a very important category in Butler's study and that's something that is picked up a whole as well in this particular section. Okay. <clears throat> So, and then she goes on to say, you know, Hall goes on to say how paradoxically as in all other identities treated polit politically in a foundational manner, this identity is based on excluding different women and by normatively prioritizing heterosexual uh, you know, relations as a basis for feminist politics. This unity, uh, Soto argues, is effective unity produced and re restrained by the very structures of power through which emancipation is sought. Significantly, however, as Soto also argues, this does not lead Butler to argue that all notions of identity should therefore be abundant because they are all theoretically flawed. Indeed, she takes a speculary structure of identification as a critical part of her argument, but she acknowledges that such an argument does suggest the necessary limits of identity politics. And this is a quotation from Butler. Uh, in this sense, identifications belong to the imaginary. They are phantasmatic efforts of alignment loyalty, ambiguous and cross-corporeal cohabitations, the unsettle uh, the I. So again, this unsettling of the I becomes a very important, um, uh, you know, very important factor in Butler. The process of identification as phantasmatic uh, efforts of alignment, and this is a beautiful phrase, efforts of alignment, the effort to align uh, together the different you know, components which are sort of woman and seamlessly. However, identifications uh, unsettle the I. They are the sedimentation of the we in the constitution of the any I, the structuring present of alterity in the very formulation of the I. Identifications are never fully and finally made. So this is something which we have seen already. Identifications are never full or formally complete. They are always happening. There's always a gap between identification and the identity aspired for. Uh, they are incessantly reconstituted and as such are subject to the, to the volatile logic of iterability. So, the iterability factor becomes a very important factor uh, in Butler. Uh, how can you iterate something? How can you inscribe something? How can you articulate something? So, you know, identifications uh, 
uh, are incessantly reconstituted, reiterated, and they are dependent, they are subject, they are contingent on the volatile logic of iterability, the volatile logic, the mercurial mutable logic of iterability, the mutable logic of articulation. And that becomes a very important factor in identification, the logic of articulation. So again, we are back to looking at representation, identification as a process of representation. And the coordinates of representations change according to discursive fields. And with those changes, the process of identifications change as well. They are what they are that which is constantly marshaled, consolidated, retrenched, contested, and on occasion compelled to give way. So, you know, this is a very Butlerian way of looking at identification as a process of uh, fractures, a process of deconstruction, uh, which are constantly marshaled, consolidated, and then fractured, and then give away at any given point of time. There's a simultaneity, there's a centerless simultaneity in the process of identification that's highlighted by Butler. Okay, so uh, the effort now to think the questions of the distinctiveness of the logic within which the racialized and ethnicized body is constituted discursively through the regulatory normative ideal of a compulsive Eurocentricism, for want of a better word, cannot be simply grafted onto the arguments briefly sketched above. But they have received an enormous and original impetus from this tangled and unconcluded uh, argument, which demonstrates beyond the shadow of doubt that a question and the theorization of identity is a matter of considerable political significance. And it's only likely to be advanced when both the necessity and the impossibility of identities and the suturing of the psychic and the discursive in the constitution are fully and unambiguously acknowledged. So the last bit is a very important and a very loaded sentence, as you can see. The word suturing is very important. Suturing is weaving in. So the suturing of what? The suturing of the psychic and the discursive in the constitution. So again, we're looking at the suturing, the weaving in. Uh, almost like a text-like, you know, textile-like weaving in, if you will, of the inside and the outside, of the psychic and the, and the discursive. So, uh, identity is a very important category as Butler articulates over here, but he also quick, very quickly says that there's a series of arguments, a series of perspectives we can take on identity and identity formations. However, you know, identity is a matter of uh, considerable political significance and it's only likely to be advanced when both the necessity and the impossibility of identities are acknowledged. So the necessity of identities and the impossibility of identities. So again, what we're looking at here is an articulation of, uh, you know, articulation of the ontology of identity as well as the articulation of the absence of identity. So absence becomes part of the ontology of identifications. Absence becomes a part of the in a politics of identification. So what you can't identify with, that too becomes a very important component of identification and that too must be acknowledged, that too must be unambiguously acknowledged according to uh, Paul over here. And what is also important, as Ho very quickly points out, is a suturing, as I mentioned, the suturing of the psyche and the discursive in the constitution. So this weaving in of the psyche and the discursive, which is a very important factor uh, for Ho. Now, this, this concludes this particular essay and you have references to Althusa as you can see and Bhava and a host of other you know, writers, Derrida, Foucault, etc. on the screen. But the point is, why, why do we read this essay? Why, why is it as important for the purpose of us uh, you know, studying cultural studies? I mean, A, Stuart Hall is one of the founding figures in cultural studies like Dick Hebditch. Uh, he was one of the first uh, philosophers, if you will, of cultural studies, someone who theorized um, cultural studies as a discipline, someone who you know, pointed out the, the necessity uh, to weave in all the different kinds of disciplines uh, in terms of looking at culture, uh, subculture, culture, uh, dominant culture, hegemonic culture, marginalized culture, etc. Uh, looking at culture as a text, looking at culture as a series of coordinates, a series of uh, you know, uh, textual possibilities and also impossibilities. So that's one, uh, the, the very importance uh, of Stuart Hall as a figure in cultural studies. And B, the reason why we, why we chose this particular text is because it, it takes up a very important topic of identification. So identity and identification becomes a very important um, category in cultural studies as we have seen already, as I hope to have established already uh, through a series of texts. So one has only to think about uh, an essay like uh, Shooting the Elephant or uh, Black Skin White Marks, that, you know, that uh, Fact of Blackness essay by Fano, where identification becomes a painful process. It is the process uh, true eradication, as a process true absence, as a process true uh, you know, non-articulation or the inability to articulate. 
a process through a liquidation of agency, etc. So all these become very important factors in identification as uh, studied by Hall. And then of course he brings in Freud, he brings in Lacan, uh, he brings in Foucault, uh, and he brings in Butler uh, towards the end. And these are writers, these are thinkers uh, who have dealt with uh, in this particular course in different degrees. We obviously dealt with uh, Baba and, uh, and, and Butler quite directly, but we also referred to in certain sections to Freud, uh, to Lacan, and a whole host of other you know, psychologists or psychoanalytic uh, thinkers. But the point is, the point that, you know, that I'm trying to convey over is about, uh, the entire idea that Hall has of bringing in these uh, writers uh, you know, in terms of looking at culture and cultural identifications is a very important lesson, it's a very important uh, study uh, for us in cultural studies of the question of identity. How identity, you know, the very important way of looking at identity uh, in, in a post Cartesian world, in a post modern world, is to move away from this, uh, the illusion, the fantasy of auton autonomous identity, the fantasy of autonomy, the fantasy of self containment, the fantasy of rationality. So these are fantasies which are done away with uh, in, uh, in, in post modernism. Uh, and what we have instead is an acknowledgement not just of fragmentation, not just of uh, you know, hybridization, but also of impossibility, uh, an acknowledgement of impossibility, an acknowledgement of absence. So these become very important acknowledgements in any question of identification. And that's something that's constantly highlighted by Hall uh, throughout this essay. And the entire idea of a compulsive Eurocentricism, which is on your screen, the normative ideal of compulsive Eurocentricism, uh, you know, that is something which is deconstructed by how and obviously is, bring, is drawing on Derrida to a great extent for that deconstruction. But the question is, before you wind up, what is compulsive uh, Eurocentricism? Compulsive Eurocentricism is a, is a notion, is an epistemic framework, an epistemic narrative which has a certain way of looking at the self, a very Cartesian understanding of the self as a rational person, as a rational free thinking person. And rationality and Eurocentric logic so these are, quite, these are you know, attributes which are considered to be almost quasi-divine in a compulsive Eurocentric discourse. These are qualities which can make a person you know, like superior. Uh, so there's a degree of superiority which is ascribed to rationality, a degree of superiority which is ascribed to the thinking man, uh, man being you know, quite literally the man, the male, etc. And this is part of the compulsive Eurocentric imaginary. Uh, of the supremacy of the white man, the supremacy of the white thinking man, the rational man, etc. And it's not hard to see how this kind of a narrative, this Eurocentric narrative, can very quickly ally itself with the narratives of imperialism, which in a way was also uh, you know, a grand narrative of the white man's supremacy, uh, which was backed and you know, uh, given a lot of impetus by other sub narratives such as the white man's burdens, etc. Uh, but that's also part of the compulsive Eurocentric package that has been highlighted over here. Now, what Hall does as a cultural theorist is that he attacks that package. He attacks, he, he deconstructs the myth of this compulsive Eurocentricism, which looks at rationality and autonomy as relational categories, as categories which inform each other, which feed off each other, and which constitute this free thinking, free will, and agency, which is non discursive in quality. And it brings us back the fact that. And this is again quite Leotardian. It brings us back to the fact that this entire idea of uh, the rational, free thinking, agentic self is a compulsive Eurocentric myth, a compulsive Eurocentric local narrative. So, in the moment you say the word Eurocentric, you're localizing the narrative, you're taking away any aspirations towards grandness, you, you're taking away, you're attacking any claims towards grandness, any claims towards uh, meta discursive uh, category. And that becomes a very important uh, condition. For Hall. So, just to sum up, and this is where we end with this essay. Uh, Stuart Hall uh, remains a very important figure for us in cultural studies uh, for a series of a number of reasons, and you know, not least because of the way in which uh, he looks at the question of identity. Uh, that's again, that's one of the things which we keep saying throughout the schools so each of the stakes they become quite prophetic in quality in terms of how they can connect to the world today, perhaps better, perhaps more complexly, how we can relate to those these stakes in the world we live in today perhaps more so than the time in which they were originally written. So the question of identity, the question of identification becomes very important for us today, not least as we inhabiting, we co-inhabit real and virtual worlds, uh, sometimes simultaneously, sometimes blurring away the borderlines between the virtual world of social media, including Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, etc., and the real world of real engagement, and how these two worlds collide with each other, and how they sort of ontologically merge with each other.
and, and its ontological merging becomes a very important uh, condition for identity production and reproduction in a postmodern world that we inhabit today. So in that sense, in that kind of a multiverse, if you will, this essay by Stuart Hall, the process of identification through a Derridean logic, you know, using a Derridean um, sort of epistemic frame to look at identification, becomes a very key essay. Uh, you know, for our understanding, not just of culture, but also how we are constituted ourselves in that cultural system that we inhabit today, we inhabit and internalize today. So that this remains one of these really foundational texts uh, for culture studies. And with that, we conclude this essay. I, mean, I hope you enjoyed it, and I do implore that you go back and read this in great details, and we'll just move on with the new text in the lectures to come. Thank you for your attention.